Okay. Good morning, everybody. So the uh, topic of today's lecture um, is creating and using objects. So we're going to, uh, instead of using primitive values most of the time, or all of the time, uh, or just arrays, we're going to start to use actual objects. Now that you've used arrays, arrays are actually objects in Java as well. But they're kind of in this middle ground where they sign up, kind of look like a primitive thing, um, but they're actually objects. Um, they're actually objects underneath the hood. Uh, so we want to start to move on to actually using and making objects. Right? So you can make an entire Java program using just primitive values. Right? Your computer program is just a bunch of ones and zeros. So you can always create a, a computer program using just uh, primitive values. Right? Uh, but almost every non-trivial program uh, makes use of objects, right? And typically very extensive use of objects, right? So in a large Java program, it would not be unusual to see um, literally tens of thousands of classes, right? And the program's probably maintaining thousands and thousands of objects at one time, and at any one time, right? And so the question is, is why use objects? So um, object-oriented programming uh, organizes uh, or structures a program in a different way uh, than the C programs that you um, are used to writing from your other courses. Right? And so the idea is, is that objects, they're the things that hold information. They can perform actions on the information. Right? You can create multiple objects of the same type, but they all have different uh, data inside of them. Right? So they have different state. Um, and so um, using objects, it, the hope is that it's easier to build complicated programs. Right? Because you can create a class, implement the functionality for the class, and uh, you've got this one unit that contains um, all the functionality uh, for this particular class. Right? And now you can reuse all of that functionality. So it uh, lets you structure your program uh, in a different way uh, than compared to the procedural programming that you learned earlier. So objects contain information and they contain, um, sorry, they contain information and they can perform actions. Right? So the information stored in variables, because that's where you store anything in a computer program, right? And so the variables uh, that uh, store the information for an object is called a field, right? You'll sometimes call, um, you'll also see these called instance variables or object variables, right? That just means variable that belongs to an object. Right? So the Java, it's uh, the standard terminology is to call that, those things fields. So the fields can be of any type, right? They can be primitive types. So you can have a field that's an int, you can have fields that are of object, uh, reference type, sorry, right? That, so an object can be made up of an object or objects, which is also, and those objects are made up of other objects, and those objects are made up of other objects, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, right? So you can create these layers of objects to increase the complexity of your program. The set of values for the object's fields is just called the state of the object, right? So if an object has two ints in it, right, then the state of the object is just the value of those two int values. Right? Objects also perform behavior, so they have methods, right? So the methods perform, uh, the methods belonging to an object operate on the data belonging to the object, right? So they operate on the fields uh, that the object has. Objects are able to talk to other objects because you have an object, you just call the method belonging to another object, right? And so um, you can, uh, objects can interact with one another, right? In object-oriented programming, this is called message passing, right? But no one, no one says that in Java, right? It's just you calling methods. Okay, so uh, the object life cycle is similar to the life cycle of a uh, dynamically allocated thing in C. Right? So to dy dynamically allocate something in C, you malloc some memory for it. Right? So you create the memory, uh, you create the um, thing, right? then you use it, right? and then hopefully you remember to free the memory uh, or free whatever resources are allocated to that object. Right? So it gets destroyed. Right? In a program like C++, uh, sorry, in a language like C++, uh, the programmer has to take care of all of these things. Right? So they're responsible for creation, the use and destruction of the object. In Java, you mostly create the object and then you use the object, but you don't care about destroying the object. So the Java language takes care of disposing of unused objects on its own. Right. Even the creation is much simpler than the creation uh, in a language like C. Right. So whenever you want to make a new object, you always use new. Right. You might call a method that returns a new object. Right. Inside that method though, eventually there will be a call to new. Right, so new is like malloc, 
it allocates memory for an object. Right. Uh, the difference compared to malloc, though, is that new also requires you to call a constructor. Right? And so the constructor is the thing that initializes the state of the newly created object. Uh, and then, uh, like malloc, it returns, well, malloc returns a pointer to the memory. New returns a reference to the created object. Right? So for C programmers, new is basically malloc, right? With some extra stuff, right? The initialization. Okay, so if you are looking at the course notebooks, you don't have to, but if you are, you'll have come across this thing called point two, right? Point two is just a class that represents a two-dimensional point, right? So it's got an X and a Y coordinate. Right. So this is an example of using the point two class. Right. It's a reference type, so we need to make a point two object before we use it. Right. So P1 is going to hold a reference to a point two object. Right. I want to make the object, so I'm going to use new. Right. When you use new, you always call a constructor. Right. The constructor always has the same name as the class. Right. So new point two, bracket, bracket, uh, calls what's called the no argument constructor to make a, a point. So if you see a constructor that has no arguments, that's, you, can, you can consider that to be the default constructor. Right? So it creates an object that has some default state. Right? For point two, it makes a point that's at the origin, right? which kind of makes sense. Right? If, you wanna, if, you, if you want a point and you don't specify its coordinates, uh, it kind of makes sense to return the point that's at the origin. Right? There's a second type of constructor here. Right? So here we make a point, uh, we have a variable P2, we make a new point two object, and we set its coordinates to one and one, uh, point five when we initialize the object. Right? So there's a second constructor. Right? So point two has at least two constructors. And if you look, there's a third one. Right? So the third one takes in a reference to another point. Right? So it takes in P2 in this case. Right? So there's a third constructor. That constructor copies the state of the other point that was passed in. Right? So uh, that constructor there copies the state of P2, which is 1 and 0.5. So P3 is a third point. It happens to have the same coordinates as the second point. But you actually have three point objects in this case. Right? And you can make more and more and more points. Right? Um, so here is an example of a different class. Uh, again, just to show you how you make an object. So this class is the class called Scanner. I'm never going to ask you to use this class, right? So scanner is the class that you, uh, is typically shown to students who are learning how to program because it lets you get input from the keyboard, right? So it's very common in these introductory programming courses that um, you get these little problems where you have to get some input from the keyboard, then you do something, you get some more input from the keyboard, do something. Nobody writes programs like that in real life. So I'm never going to ask you to do one like that. If you wanted to write a program like that, you can use scanner, right? So you make a scanner object. System.in is standard input uh, for C programmers, right? So that's hooked up to the keyboard. So you make a scanner that can read the keyboard. So that's what that's doing there. Right? You can make a scanner that can read a string like that, right? And then you can use the scanner methods to um, extract the parts of the string, right? So for example, you can ask it for the uh, next int that's in the string. So it starts at the front and it gives you back the one, right? Then you can ask for the next string and that gives you back the fish and then so on and so on and so forth. OK, so when you uh, use new, you must call a constructor. The constructor always has the same name as the class uh, that you're trying, uh, that the class that you're trying to make an object of, right? When you call a constructor, it looks exactly like calling a method. So it's a little bit confusing, because the language says constructors aren't methods. So it's explicitly stated, a constructor is not a method. Uh, in particular, a constructor never returns a value, not even void but they look a lot like methods. Where are the constructors defined? Well, when you make a class, you define the constructors inside the class. Right? And the name of the constructor must exactly match the name of the class. Right? What are constructors used for? They initialize the state of the object. Right? If you're going to memorize something, that last line is worth memorizing. Right? What is the job of a constructor? It's to initialize the state of an object. Right? No argument constructor is the constructor that ha where the caller calls the constructor and passes in no information, right? Its purpose is to initialize a newly created object to some well-defined default state. Uh, 
right? So unlike malloc, which gives you back a chunk of memory where anything can be in memory, right? When you call new and then call a constructor, typically the object that's created gets set to some well-defined state, right? So if the caller doesn't ask or doesn't specify the starting state, um, you can include a no argument constructor in your class to return back a object initialized to a default state. You don't have to, right? So not every class defines a no argument constructor. That third one there is an example of what's called a copy constructor. Right? And so a copy constructor is a constructor where the input type is the same type as the class that it's defined in. So if you were to go and look at, well, let's look, go look at that constructor in Eclipse. Uh, so you actually have so access to all this source code, right? So if you download, there's a zip file that you can download that contains all the source code uh, for the course, right? That will uh, give you a project called sys124. It might be called sys124 current or something like that, right? Uh, but all the source code is in here. There's a lot of it, as you can see. Right? So uh, under geometry, there's a class called point2. Right? So there's my class point2. Right? Here you can see, oh, uh, ignore this for now. Right? So here you can see it's got two fields. Right? So the, uh, the way you declare a field is you uh, make variables. Right? You don't put them inside a method, you put them inside the class. Right? And so these variables, x and y, these are available to all objects of type point2. There's your point two, there's your no argument constructor. Right? Notice it just sets x and y to zero. Right? Ignore the this, I'll explain what that means later. Right? Here's our copy constructor. Right? So the copy constructor, right, it has a parameter whose type is exactly the same as the class. Right? So the input to, uh, to this constructor is an object of type point two. What does it do? It copies the other object. Right? And so that, that, whoops, sorry, that constructor, that third one there shown in red, right, is the copy constructor for this, uh, is an example of using the copy constructor for this class. Oh, that's a typo. Not every class defines a copy constructor. Right? And finally, uh, you can add as many constructors as you want to the class, as long as the parameter lists are all unique. Right? And so that particular constructor there lets the user pass in an x and a y value sets the coordinates of the point to the x and y value that's passed in. Right. There's, a, there's the example of the scanner again. Right. So here's the scanner. This one has a constructor that takes in uh, what's called a standard stream. Right. And there's a constructor that takes in a string. Right. So this is just showing you that you can have many different constructors in the class. Once you've created the object, so once you've called new and then called the constructor and gotten back a reference to the object, now you can use it. Uh, and so uh, you always access objects in Java via a reference, right? Which, as far as you guys are concerned, is just a pointer, right? So you're always accessing it via pointer, right? So there is no way for you to get access to the object directly in Java. It's always indirectly through a pointer or a reference, right? And it's always the dot operator to call a method belonging to the object, right? So there's no arrow in uh, Java, right? Which you would use if you had a um, uh, if you had a pointer to a structure, for example. Right, so it's always the dot. So, right, so the uh, point two class has got a bunch of methods in it. They're all relatively simple. Right, the one called x right, returns the x coordinate of the point. Right. So that returns point five. Right. The one called y, not surprisingly, returns the y coordinate of the point. Right. So that, uh, that gives you back point one. Right. To call the method, variable name, dot, method name, round bracket, round bracket. There's a, now in uh, Java, you are allowed to have methods that have the same name in the same class, right? So there's another method called x, right? But this one takes in uh, a value for the x coordinate. So this one changes the value of the x coordinate for the point, right? So this sets the x coordinate of the point p to 0 0.5 plus 0.1, so 0.6, right? And that sets the y coordinate of the point to, uh, 0.1 minus 0.1, so zero, right? There's a, another method called set that lets you set both coordinates at the same time, right? So set the x and the y coordinate of the point in one call, to, in a single method call, right? So here's a little program that move, takes a point, 
and moves it back and forth on your screen. Right? It uses this class called standard draw, uh, which is a class that Princeton uses uh, for its Java course. Right? It just lets you draw simple shapes on the screen. Right? So I'm just going to move this point back and forth. Exactly how this works, not super important. Right? Uh, if you're looking in the lecture, oh wait, is this here? I don't remember if this is here. Um, uh, it's here on mine, but I may have created this separately. You might have to copy and paste the code from the slide if you want to run this. So I called this almost Pong. Oops, sorry, wrong class, hang on here. Save. This one here, run that. Right. right, looks like the worst video game you've ever seen, right? Uh, so the ball just bounces back and forth, right? Now, this does not look terribly impressive, however, Oh, sorry. Where'd it go? Slide. Where are they? Pong. That thing there is the video game called Pong. Um, so it came out in the 70s. Um, it doesn't look terribly impressive, right? Basically, you, one player one can move their paddle up and forth, up and down. Player two can move their paddle up and down. This is basically like air hockey, right? So if the ball gets past the paddle, you score a point, right? This looks like the worst video game ever, right? especially to you guys, now that you, because your video games that you have now are in amazing what they can do, right? This thing here made a fortune, right? They made consoles that did nothing but play Pong. Someone went out, designed a CPU for a console, they designed all the hardware for the console, and they would sell that to you, right? Arcades got their start, um, is it here? There, right? With this video game, right? Generated, for an arcade, it generated like an, uh, an absurd amount of money, right? You'd put a quarter in, you'd play this game, right? This basically launched the video game industry, right? You can do it in a very small number of lines of Java, right? Uh, almost, right? You just gotta stick the paddles in and control how the ball bounces. Uh, if, uh, you have to make the ball move at angle. It's easy to do, right? Shortly after Pong came out, someone said, hey, what if we turn it 90 degrees? Well, we got breakout now. Right? This game also made uh, a ton of money right? and launched all sorts of clones after it. Right? So this was, uh, if you've heard of Atari, this was the birth of Atari. Right? Um, who did this, who did Breakout? I don't remember who published Breakout. Oh, it's also a Atari. Right? Um, so uh, if you've happened to have heard of that video game company, um, these are some of the early games from that company. Okay, so there's a slightly more sophisticated example called bouncing ball. Right. So this one uses what you learned in physics uh, in first year. So it uses the um, equations of a projectile falling under the influence of gravity, right? And simulates a bouncing ball. So this thing just bounces uh, repeatedly, right? It flashes and stuff like this because this isn't, uh, because this particular library is not meant to do animation, right? It's meant to draw static images. Right? So yeah, it doesn't look great, um, but it's relatively easy to do. Right? Again, this is a few dozen lines of uh, Java in here. Okay. Uh, there's another example of Scanner. Again, I'm not gonna ask you about Scanner. If you wanna know how to read uh, from standard input, you can use this example. Right? Um, so when you go to use an object, or when you go to use a class, right? obviously you need to know, well, how do I use this class? Right? And so, um, the, all of the documentation for the Java standard library classes are available online, right? So I've shown you how to look at them before, right? And so uh, at some point you have to learn at least how to skim through the documentation for a class, right? It's not terribly hard to do, right? So I'm just gonna very, very quickly take you through an example. Right? So let's look at the, um, Wow, this is really slow. Okay, so when you, uh, if you happen to land on the home page uh, for the documentation, it's not super user friendly, right? Over here are all the classes that are part of the standard library, right? Now the problem is there's thousands of classes here. So if you were to scroll through this, it's gonna take you forever to find something that you want, right? So it's normally easier to search for something uh, in particular, right? If you happen to know how the classes are organized, uh, then you can, um, uh, you can type in the URL, right? So I happen to know how they are organized, at least for Java 8, 
So I know how to get to the string class uh, documentation very straightforwardly, uh, very easily. Right? When you read the documentation, right, up here there's a bunch of information that won't make any sense to you until uh, for another few weeks. Right, so this describes the inheritance structure of the class. I'll explain what that means uh, later in the course. Right, there's a description of what the class does. It often contains useful information that no one reads. Right? Um, if you have fields that are publicly available, or so if you have fields that are, have a public access modifier, they'll show up here. Right? So the math class documents E and pi in the field section. Right? Then you'll see the constructor section. If you click on one of these things, it takes you to the detailed uh, description of the um, constructor. So if I click on that, it jumps down to the page and now there's a detailed description of what this thing does. Right. Once you scroll past the um, constructor section, you get to the method, se the method section. Right? And again, if you click on one of the methods, it goes to the detailed description of what it does. Right. Over here, it tells you what the return type is. So car at returns a uh, car, right? And it requires uh, an integer index as its argument. You click on it, it gives you the detailed description of exactly what it does, right? If it throws an exception, it tells you here that it, what type of exception might be thrown, right? It documents the return value, it documents the parameters, right? And it describes uh, what the method does. Right. So Java is the, I think it's the first language uh, where all documentation was placed online. Right, so it's available to you um, via a web page of some kind. Right, there's a tool that actually generates this documentation for you. Right, so if you've done lab one, you will have seen these big comments that are uh, in, part, in some of the methods that I gave you for lab one. Those, uh, doc, that doc, those comments are used to generate all of this. Right, so there's a tool called Javadoc that does, uh, that does the uh, documentation generation for you. Okay. So that's the introduction to using objects. Now we actually want to start using some interesting objects that aren't just strings. Right, and so we're gonna jump into uh, lists. Right, so the difference, one of the differences between uh, Java and C is that the Java standard library has a very rich set of data structures and many, many, many other classes available to you straight out of the box. Right, so the standard Java installation gives you things like lists, it gives you sets, it gives you maps or dictionaries or associative arrays, if you learned about those in your data structures course, um, and a whole bunch of other things, right? Stacks and queues, they're all there for you, right? And so um, the programmer doesn't have to implement them if they're happy with the uh, versions that are provided by the standard library, right? Java does provide you with a list type, right? So lists are, well, that's no good. Uh, Lists, are, they provide similar functionality to a Python list or a linked list if you learn how to implement a linked list in C, right? Now, they're not necessarily linked lists in Java, right? Did you, did you teach you how to uh, make an array-based list in your data structure course? Yeah, okay, so, the, uh, so Java has both of them. So there's an array-based list and there's a linked, uh, uh, a linked list type in Java. So normally uh, when you're using a, so when you want to use a list, so you basically you want an array, but you want to be able to change the size of the array. So you want it to increase and decrease in size automatically, right? You'd like to insert and remove, right? And you don't want to have to write all of those array-based methods yourself, right? You can just use a list uh, class, right? So there's two main types of lists in Java. So they provide you with both linked lists and array lists, right? For the time, most of the time you want to use an array list. Uh, because it's almost always faster than a linked list. So the type in Java is big A, array, and then big L, list. So again, why? I guess I never edited these slides uh, for this particular course. So uh, one of the differences, so in a Java list, you can, a list can hold elements of one type, right? Or for the time being, they hold elements of a single type. So you make a list that can hold a bunch of integers, you can make a list that holds a bunch of doubles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Now, the syntax for creating such a list is a bit funny. So you're supposed to say what is the element type, right? and you put those inside of the angled brackets. Right? So you're only gonna use this notation when you're using what are called generic classes. Right? And so the list is an example of a generic class in Java. Right, so here's an example, 
of making uh, an array list of string. Right? So the type is array list, right? Big A, big L, right? I want to make a list of strings. So inside some angled brackets, I put in the word string, right? So that thing there is your element type. Right? There's your variable. There's new, and there's your call to the constructor. Right? When you call the constructor, you also insert the element type inside the angled brackets. Right? Round bracket, round bracket. So that makes a new empty array list that can hold a bunch of strings. Right? Now you don't, so you don't have to type in all of this. Right? So after Java 7, so whatever version of Java you're currently using now, you don't need that, uh, the, type of the element type on the right hand side anymore. Right? You need it when you declare the variable, right? but when you call the constructor, you can just use a pair of empty angled brackets. Right? If you leave off the angled brackets, right? uh, so in particular, if you, yeah, if you leave off the angled brackets, um, Eclipse will warn you that there's a, uh, there's, um, Eclipse will warn you that you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing, but it's not an error. So that's a bit weird. Right? Uh, and so uh, the reason that happened is because, or that happens, is because this angled bracket notation, uh, or more precisely, generic types, didn't show up in the language until Java version six or five, one of the two, right? And so there was an existing array list class, but it worked differently um, than th uh, the class that I'm showing you here. Okay, there's another funny thing about uh, Java lists, right? If you're using a list in Java, you can't make a list where the elements are have primitive type. That D is a Ignore the D, it's a typo, right? So you can't make an array list of int. You really want to make an array list of int often, right? I want a list of int, can't do it, right? Again, this is a limitation of, the, uh, of Java's generic type mechanism, right? Because they added this feature late in the language, right, uh, they had to retrofit it in. One of the um, consequences of doing this is that you can't make a list of primitive type, which is annoying. Uh, however, there's a solution. Right? So in Java, every primitive type has a corresponding reference type. Right? Unfortunately, the naming is inconsistent. Right? So little b boolean, there's also a type big B boolean. Right? So the reference type is called a wrapper class. Right? Little b byte, there's a, a wrapper class called big B byte. Right? Notice car is big C character, not big C car. Exactly why they did this, I have no idea. Right? Int is integer, big I integer, right? So there are some exceptions that you have to remember, right? Annoying, but um, for some reason when the classes were created, this is what they named them. Okay, so what the wrapper classes let you do is uh, they let you almost seamlessly convert from a primitive value to a reference type and from a reference type back to a primitive value, right? So almost all the time you can take a Boolean value, so something that's true or false, and convert it to a Boolean object whose state is true or false, right? I can take the number one and convert it to an integer object that represents the number one. If you have the integer object that represents the number two, you can almost always convert it to an int whose value is two, right? So that's the purpose of the wrapper classes, right? So like the string classes, the wrapper classes get special treatment by the compiler, right? The compiler tries to convert between the wrapper type and its corresponding primitive type uh, seamlessly, right? So here's an int i, its value is one, right? Here's an integer object j, I am allowed to set it to i, so that works no problem. You can set it to five if you wanted to, that also works no problem. You can also go the other way, right? So if I have an int variable k, I can get the int value out of the object j uh, like that, again seamlessly, right? So this works, the compiler takes care of all of the stuff that has to happen under the hood for you, right? So if you want a list of primitive element type, you have to make a list of the corresponding um, wrapper type. So if you wanted a list of int, it becomes a list of big I integer, right? If you want a list of little d double, it becomes a list of big D double. If you want a list of car, it becomes a list of big C character, right? So you just have to remember, use the wrapper type if you want a list of primitive type. Oh, this is useless. It's all right. I guess I will kill this slide and end the lecture. Is, it, is this a good place to stop? No, this is not a good place to stop. All right. So, um, how many of you know Python? Anybody? A few of you. Most of you? Almost all of you. All right. So, 
If you know Python, this might be useful to you. So this shows you how to convert from Python into Java. Um, since my assumption is that you only know C, this slide is no good. So we'll have to go to the next slide and um, hopefully it's set up a little bit better for this course. I suspect it's not, so let's see what happens. Here we are. Uh, oh, it looks like I did change it. Okay, so I guess we're in good shape. Okay. Uh, right, so when you use a list where the elements are of uh, wrapper type, right, you can always pretend, almost always pretend that the list contains primitive types instead. Right. So there's a method called add that lets you add an element to the end of the list. There's a method called get that lets you get the element at a specified index. Right. So the lists let you pretend the list uh, is like an array. Right. You can go and get an element at a specified uh, location in the list. Right. So it's a zero-based index, so it behaves similarly to a, an array. So here's a list of integers. Right. I can add an element to the list using the add method. Right. So you add and then you pass in the value of the element that you want to add. Right. So I'd like to add the number 100 to the end of the list. This is a list of big I integer, right? So when you try to add an int to the list, the compiler takes the int, converts it to an integer object, and then adds the integer object to the list. If you'd like to get an element from the list, right, again, it's a list of integer, right? So get returns a reference to an integer object, right? If you try to store that in an int, though, the compiler extracts the int value out of the integer object uh, and then stores the int value in first. Right, so get zero, get the first element from the list. Right, get one, get the second element. So on and so on and so forth. If the index that you pass in is not valid, right, so in other words, if it's less than zero or greater than, the, greater than or equal to the size of the list, uh, you get an exception. There's uh, one situation that you might want to keep in mind uh, where this doesn't work. Right, so if you make a list of integer, Right? And you add a bunch of elements to the list, right? And decide later on, hey, I want to remove an element. Right? There's, there's a remove method. Right? The unfortunate part here is that there's two remove methods. Right? One of the remove methods takes in an int and it removes the element at that index. Right? The other remove method takes in a value and tries to, searches the list for that value and then removes the first occurrence of that value. So if you say remove 100, right, the version of the method that you get is the one that removes the element at index 100, right? It doesn't remove the value 100 from the list, right? So here, if you want to remove the value 100 from the list, this is the one exception. You actually have to pass in an integer object whose value is 100. Right? So if you really want to remove the value 100, you have to do something like that, right? Um, so the the fact that the conversion between uh, the wrapper types and primitive types is seamless sometimes causes problems, right? Uh, in particular, um, it can cause a problem like that. Okay, this is better. List operations, right? So the no argument constructor, so make an empty list, right? It's just new, array list, angled bracket, angle bracket, nothing inside the round brackets. Normally, that's the constructor that you're using, right? If you're, uh, if you're making, if you're calling the constructor and you want a list of 10 elements, right, and you pass in 10, that doesn't do what you want it to do, right? It makes a list that can hold up to 10 elements uh, by default, right? But it doesn't actually fill in the list with anything, right? So whenever you call the constructor here, you're always getting an empty list. You have to populate the list yourself, right? There's no shortcut for populating the list like there is for initializing an array. Right, so you can't use angled brackets, uh, the braces, sorry, to uh, set the elements of the list. Right, you have to call uh, get, set, or add, sorry, you have to call add uh, repeatedly to add the uh, elements to the list. Right, if you wanna know if the list is empty, there's an is empty method. Right, the size of the list, so this is different from strings uh, and arrays. Right, so the, uh, the size of the list um, or the number of elements in the list is, access, is given by the method called size, right? It's not length, right? It's not a field called length, right? It's a method called size. 
add adds to the end of the list. Right? So that appends. Right? Get gets an element from the list. Right? Set sets an element at that index uh, in the list. So it sets the element at index zero to goodbye. Right? The, one, the thing you have to watch out for here, right? so one of the common things that new, programmers, uh, ja new Java programmers do is they make a list T, right? and they say, okay, I want to put the uh, element goodbye at index zero of the list. Right? And so they call set to set el the element at index zero to the uh, string goodbye. Right. What you have to remember is that when you make the list, it's empty. So there is no element at index zero. Right. Set actually replaces an existing element. Right. So arguably, it's badly named. Um, it's named this way, though, because it's short to write. Right. So if you try to set element zero in a list that's empty, the set method fails. Right. It says the index is out of bounds. You can't, there is no element at that, uh, at that index. Right. So if you want to add stuff to a list, it's add, right? If you, uh, once you've added stuff to a list, now you can go and set or replace the elements in the list, right? So don't use set to populate a list, right? Use add. Uh, lists can search themselves, right? So if you want to know does a list contain a value, the method is called contains, right? Returns true or false. If you have another list, Right? And you'd like to add the elements of that list to the end of another list, that's add all. Right? So t.addAll, another list, takes all the elements from another list, adds them to the end of t. Right? If you want to remove an element from the list, you have two choices. You can remove by index. Right? So t.remove index removes the element at the specified index. Right? It returns the, re uh, the removed element back to the user. Right, so you can store the removed element in the variable um, after calling remove. Right. If you want to remove the first instance of an object from a list, right, then you can also pass in a, uh, this says always a reference. Right. So that's a reference to an element. Right, and that will remove the first occurrence of that element from the list. Uh, if the element does not in the list, it returns null. Right. Uh, so you have to watch out for that. Um, uh, you sometimes have to watch out for that, right? So if you're going to use the second version of the method, right, you have to make sure that the element is already there, or you have to be prepared for the fact that it might return null. Uh, you can get a sublist from a list in Java. Uh, so I'm going to show you this method in more detail later on. Uh, this method often turns out to be very handy. So you can get part, uh, a contiguous part of a list, so that's called a sublist. Right, by using the sublist method, you pass in the starting index, right, so the start of where you want the sublist to be, right, and then you pass in a value that's one greater than the stopping index. Right, so one three would give you the elements at index one and two. Right, and it gives you back a new list um, that you can use to operate on the sublist. When you change the sublist, you also change the original list, uh, which turns out to be very handy. Finally, if you want to copy a list, there's a copy constructor. Right? So I can make a new list U by copying an existing list T. Right? So you get a new list, you get, uh, and that new list contains all the elements that T also contains. Right? The elements are not new copies of the existing elements. Right? So U contains the same elements that T contains. Right? If you modify one of the elements in T, then U will also see the modified element. Right? So you don't get copies of the elements themselves. Right? You just get a new list. Okay, so there's a companion class for lists called collections, big C collections. Right? Uh, inside that class uh, are a bunch of useful static methods that operate on lists and sets, actually. Right. So if you want to count the number of times A, B, C appears in the string T, there's a method called frequency. Right. It's inside the collections class. Right. So import Java util collections, and now you can use all the methods in collections. Right. There's a reverse method that lets you reverse the order of the elements in a list. If you want to sort a list, collections has got a sort method. Right. So collections.sort, pass in the list T, that will sort the list, assuming the elements of the list are comparable. 
Uh, in newer versions of Java, you can sort directly from the list class itself, right? So there's a method called sort that every list uh, knows about. You pass in null. Um, the object that you pass in is an object that knows how to compare elements in the list, right? So for the time being, you're just gonna pass, if you wanted to use that method, you can just use null. Okay, iterating over the elements in the list. Similar to iterating over the elements in an array, right? If you want to, you can write a for each loop uh, where the target of the for each loop is, an array, uh, is, an, uh, is a list, right? So T is gonna be a non-empty list of strings, right? I would like to find the shortest string in T, right? So it's non-empty, so I know that the first element uh, exists, so I can call get zero and get the first element. I can look at the length of that element by calling length, right? Remember for, list, for strings, the length of the string is length. Right? I now wanna look at every uh, string in the list, right? I actually wanna skip the first element, but if you're gonna use a for each loop, you can't, right? So for every element in the list T, right? So for each string S, oops, sorry, I, du, du, du. So for each string s in t, right, I'm just gonna look at the string s and look at its length, right? So if the length of s is less than the current minimum length, right, I now have a new shortest string, right? So min length is now equal to the length of s and the shortest string is now s, right? When you get to the end of the loop, right, s will be, the, um, will be a reference to the shortest string in the list, right? So you can write a for each loop to iterate over the elements of a list. Right? If you want a counting style loop, well, you can do that too. Right? So using a counting style loop or a C style loop, right? it's the exact same code. Now I'm gonna start at index one, right? because I've already processed the first element up here. Right? I want uh, my index to go up to, but not including the size of the list. Right? Each time through the loop, I wanna increase the index by one. Right, and now inside the loop, I need to get the element from the list. So here I have to explicitly call get, right, rather than relying on the for each loop uh, to get the element for you. Right, so there's get, there's size. Right. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, if you're gonna search for the shortest uh, string in a list, right, um, you have to be prepared for the fact that the list might be empty. Right, so this is something you plan on doing over and over and over again. You just write a method to do this. So here's a static method that returns the shortest string in a list T, right? Whenever you're working with these collections, right? And so in Java, uh, you're always concerned that is the array, the set, the list, or the map empty, right? Because uh, the, it's possible to have an empty collection in Java, right? No empty um, arrays in C, so you typically aren't worried about this, right? And so often the empty collection is a special case, right? If someone's asking for the shortest string in an empty list, that string doesn't exist. So if the list is empty, it makes sense in this case to throw an exception, right? It doesn't always make sense to throw an exception, right? Depending on the problem that you're trying to solve, right? But for this particular example, if there is no shortest list, uh, if, there's, if there is no shortest string, right, then uh, you should probably indicate that to the caller somehow, right? You could instead return null, but now the caller has to deal with the fact that the reference that's returned might be null, right? Now the rest of the code just goes into the method and you return shortest at the end of the method. Right? Okay, I'm gonna stop there. So this is, uh, the next example is gonna be using a list. Uh, we're gonna do a simple simulation uh, of rolling dice um, for the, in the, uh, I guess on Monday. So that's it for this week, um, unless you have a lab tomorrow. Um, if you do, I'll see you tomorrow.